We are on week six of a series that we're calling Glory that's centered around John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And so this is 26 verses. I'm going to go out and say it's some of the most, all of the word of God is inspired. We know that. All of, all of God's word is for edification. It brings strength. It brings correction. It's a, it's a, it's a compass for us how we navigate our lives and but specifically this chapter is so powerful because it's it was it's the longest prayer recorded prayer of Jesus it's 26 verses we know Jesus prayed a lot we know Jesus constantly would he would disappear the disciples didn't know where he was and they'd find him in a garden praying he'd disappear they'd find him up he was up on a mountain praying or he'd get in a boat row out to the middle of the Sea of Galilee so he could talk to his dad. But we really didn't know exactly what he was talking about and what those prayers were like. But John 17 gives us a beautiful picture of what those prayers were like. And over the past six weeks, we've broken it down. It's really this prayer is broken into three categories. The first five verses, Jesus prays for himself. Uh, verse 5 to about verse 17 18, Jesus prays for his, the followers, his disciples. And then our text this morning is where Jesus prays for the world. He prays for those that haven't believed yet. So 2,000 years ago, at that time, Christianity was Jesus and, and, and uh, those 12 ragtags that he put together, disciples that came from all different backgrounds, and they were going around turning the world upside down. And this was right before the night that we know is the, the week of his passion. This prayer comes right on the heels where his life really unravels. Everything that has happened up to this point, the disciples are denying him. And just, you know, one chapter over, you can turn the page, chapter 18. His life begins to, seems like, to fall apart. Everything that he had built up to that point begins to shake. And there's some unraveling that takes place. And so this prayer is a powerful prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus prayed before he went from, from earth to heaven, right? This is the prayer that Jesus prayed before he accomplished what he said he was on this earth to do. This is a powerful prayer. This is a prayer that we can keep deep in our hearts that's going to give us strength when we need it, direction when we need it. And so I want, to, I want to start in verse 17. I'm going to read these last few verses of this prayer. Because verse 17, you know, last week kind of tags on to this week. So we're going to read it together. And Jesus is praying and he's talking about us, those that are committed followers, disciples. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world for them I sanctify myself that they too could be truly sanctified verse 20 my prayer is not just for the disciples alone right I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one father just as you are in me and I am in you may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22. I've given them the glory that you gave me. We could spend a week on that. That's powerful. He's saying the glory that I have, I've given to you. We, we have this glory. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, right? We carry this glory around. That they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity. To let the world know that you sent me. And have loved them even as you have loved me. Verse 24. Father, I want those that you've given me to be with me where I am. And to see my glory. The glory that you have given. Because you loved me before the creation of the world. Powerful. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you've sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. 
So we finish this prayer, 26 verses. Now we've read through it over the last six weeks. In the last 10 verses, we just read them together. I want you to see uh, there's two things that really rise to the top. Jesus makes two requests, but then he also reminds those that are listening to his prayers of two important things of why he came. And in John 1, I'm just going to try to stay in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, it opens up with, In the beginning was the Word of God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. And all things were made, right? Everything that we see was made by this Word. If we go back to Genesis, we know that God created the earth, everything we see, with His Word. He spoke it into existence. Incredible. But John, right out of the gate in chapter 1, and dozens of times we see Jesus in just the Gospel of John talk about this one word, truth. In that prayer, verse 17, verse 18, he's asking, God, sanctify, asking his Father, sanctify my followers, the disciples, me and you in this room, with the truth. Sanctify, set them apart, help them walk into their destiny with this truth. And so over and over and over, we see Jesus was really, really concerned about bringing truth to this world. And he would say things like, I come to bring truth, but this world doesn't know truth. They can't understand it. They don't know this truth. But, but those who God has given me, they will know this truth. It's what separates us from everyone else on the planet. There's this truth that has come into our life that has changed us. And so one chapter over, chapter 18, Jesus is arrested. You know the story. He was lied on, just Judas, for a few golden coins, enough to buy a field. Betrays Jesus, goes to the high priest, tells him where he is, kisses him, betrays him with a kiss. Come on, somebody. And then he ends up in front of this, this king, Pilate. Pontius Pilate, you know the story, maybe you don't, but I got to believe that Pilate was a busy guy. He was running things, probably just, you know, really he didn't understand what was going on, he was just going through the motions, probably woke up that morning like it was just another day. And here's this, they labeled him at this point the king of the Jews, and the priests, the high priests of the Jews, the ones that Jesus came to reach, are now shouting, we want him to die. And the high priest didn't have the power to do it. And so now they take him to Pilate. And Pilate's having a conversation with Jesus. And he asks him, tell me about this. You know, you're the king of the Jews. And Jesus replies. He says, well, this kingdom that I've come to bring, you don't know anything about it. My kingdom is not of this world. I've come to bring truth. John 8, 18. And then Pilate asks him this question. What is truth? That's an important question. That may be the most important question in the 21st century. What is truth? What is right? What is wrong? How should I live my life? How, how should I discern what to do with the time that I have on this planet? What is, I want to give my life to truth. What's what's real, what's going to last, but, but I don't know what is what, Pilate, the, the question that's echoed through the ages, what is truth? Jesus was asked 168 questions in the New Testament. He answered 165 of those with questions. He never gave the answers. This particular question, when Pilate asked him, do you know what he said? Nothing. Now here is Jesus standing before a king, the one that has his life in his hands, and he wants to know what is truth. And if Jesus is the Son of God, and, and that's what we believe, he has the answers. But he didn't say a word. And I think it's a question that we all have to answer in our hearts. It's a question that we all have to come to terms with. It's a question that Jesus could have answered in the most brilliant way, but he stayed silent. Why? I don't, I don't know. You know, I think a lot of times maybe he knew that 
Some people, they couldn't, you can't handle the truth, right? What is that? What movie is that? A Few Good Men, is that it? You want the truth? You can't handle the truth, right? Nietzsche said that the value of a man is based upon how much truth he can handle. A lot of people can't stomach truth right now. You start telling the truth, you're going to make enemies. You start telling the truth, your church is going to thin out. You start telling the truth, you're going to get emails on Monday. And you're going to have people that want to meet and want to know why you said this and what this meant. Because the truth is not easily digested. So Jesus saved his breath. He knew. Pilate just was asking a, a, a question that he was not ready for the answer to. And so what is truth? I'm a fan of a guy named Francis Schaeffer, and he wrote a book called A Christian Manifesto. He's passed away now. And uh, when I first got into church, I was in high school when I first began going to church. And, and the church I was going to, they would bring politicians in quite a bit to talk and to teach. And, and, this, and I can't remember. I think she was a state representative. I don't remember exactly. Um, but she talked about this book, Francis Schaeffer, A Christian Manifesto. And in this book, it talks about truth. And he talks about what happens in a society when they remove themselves from what he called absolute truth. That there's certain things that, that, that every single person, it's in our Declaration of Independence. We've been endowed by a creator with certain inalienable rights. And why is that important? Why does that matter right now? Because when we lose a concept and a grasp of what truth is, and we begin to make truth, or we, we create truth out of our own self, according to Francis Schaeffer, it always leads to chaos. And so he would talk about, in this talk, he, he went around to several universities and gave this speech that he called a Christian manifesto. He talked about absolute truth, and he would talk about how law is created. Now, I know this, this seems like maybe it doesn't make sense right now, but I think it's important that we hear this. Because when we look at when our forefathers got together and this, the Declaration of Independence was written, there's that one part that they wrote in there about being endowed by a creator. And so even, I think only one pastor signed it. And these men from, were from all different faith backgrounds. They all bent a knee to a creator. They understood that their job was not to create law, but to interpret absolute truth that came from a God. Come on, some, this makes, that, that, and, and so what is right and wrong in society, it's called situational laws, what we're seeing a lot of now. I'm not a lawyer. I just read a book, y'all. We got some in the church. Y'all help me out. Help me out if I'm, if I, but situational law, arbitrary law, is we're just going to write a law based on what's best for man at the given time. And that's what ushered in Nazi Germany, in that regime. When we decide that it's better to kill masses of people because we want to have an a, 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 a elite race, do you see where that can go? When we have no bearings or moral compass, and our forefathers knew this, they understood absolute truth. They knew that they were not trying to create law. They were trying to do their very best to interpret this God-given law in our life. And so truth, what is truth? What is truth? We have to answer that. And when Pilate was standing looking in the eyes of Jesus and he asked, what is truth? I don't think Jesus said a word to him because he was looking at it. He was standing right in front of him. It's John 13. He was somewhere in there. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. He made audacious statements. And that's why he was <laughs> wanted. And that's why he was killed. And that's why everywhere they went, they turned cities upside down and communities upside down because the, the world does not, they can't stomach that type of truth. They don't want to hear that type of truth. You know, humanism, Francis Schaeffer, humanism, it puts man at the, at the center of everything. That everything, even the gospel, everything is for the happiness of man. 
Law is for the happiness of man. We're here to just be happy. But truth says, no, 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 we're here to bring glory to God. We're here to use our life that God has given us to bring him glory and to make him famous. And, and that there are in, uh, inalienable rights that every human being has been given and endowed by their creator. A judge didn't give them that rights. A pastor didn't give them that rights. A pope, a priest. No, no, no. God gave them that right. And when we move away from that, when we have no absolute truth in our life and just case, sirrah, sirrah, what will be, will be, and so it goes, we lose it all. So that question, it's powerful. What is truth? We have to answer that for ourselves. How am I going to live my life? How am I going to base my life on what's right and wrong? What am I going to do when the government tells me or mandates or, or writes law that I feel like is contrary to this law? I don't have time to go into that. But, but uh, it, it, <laughs> in this book, uh, a, a, a Christian manifesto, he writes about it. He, he talks about that. That you know, The way he puts it is when, when, when the law of the land violates, violates the law of God, we have a duty as believers to violate the law of the land. This goes back to, this goes back to Genesis. This goes back to Moses and his mother. And it was the only way that she kept him alive. She broke the law. Because the law of the land broke the law of God. And so what is truth? I think truth's a person. I think it was a law for a long time. And we read about it in the Old Testament and the laws and different things. And God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them. This is, this is the, the best way I believe that we can live our lives is, is based on this book right here. But then he took it one step further. He said, I'm going to take this law... And I'm going to make it a person. And I don't know the law. I don't know the law. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. But I, I'm finding the more I can know this person, the more I'm going to know the law. Right? It's those bracelets. What would Jesus do? The more I can treat people and interact with people the way that Jesus treated and interacted with people, I think the closer that I am to walking in the law of God. And so how did Jesus do that? How do we apply truth to our lives? What is it? Does that mean that, okay, here we go. So I know what truth is. I believe that I have the truth. And so I guess now it's my duty to convince everybody out there that I'm right and they're wrong. That's been kind of the popular posture of the church for a long time. But I think there's three ways, there's three areas that we're called to apply this truth. Once we've come to know what truth is for ourselves, once we come to know, and I'm not talking about speaking my truth, right? That, that's really popular right now. It, what's my truth? Well, you, it, that's, that's great. We can speak our truth, but what, what is the truth? There has to be some kind of absolute. And so when we figure this out, when we find this, when we, when we feel within ourselves we know what truth is and, or who truth is, I think that there's different ways that we apply this truth. That God's called us to apply this truth. The first place is ourselves. Jesus is, is speaking truth to his disciples. He's teaching them about the kingdom of heaven, about these mysteries that have been kept for, for decades and, and centuries. And then they wanted to take that and go and start kind of like putting it out and, and basically clotheslining people with it. And, and Jesus said something like this. He said, but bef before you go and point out a speck in somebody else's eye, check out the log in your own. <laughs> and so when we, when we apply this truth, Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. It starts with applying truth to our lives. It starts personally. It starts with me it starts with me submitting myself under the truth of God's word knowing that that, that this is truth knowing that 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 God has that these truths that come into our life as, as God begins to speak into our life and as this Bible begins to make sense that this truth starts with me the psalmist says it like this 
I've desired truth, Psalm 51, in the inward parts. In the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. I'm finding that successful people will pay somebody to tell them the truth. They hire coaches. They hire consultants. They surround people around them that aren't just yes men and yes women. And they're open to feedback. They're open to people that will speak into their lives. But not only that, our, our first spot, the first place it starts is taking this word and measuring our life based on this book. Not other people. <laughs> you know, I can find another Christian that's maybe struggling a little more than I am and make myself feel good about it. I can find another pastor, right? Google pastor and hit news and you'll be shot. Don't do it. I mean, it's every day. So, I mean, every day there's uh, just stuff is, cr people are going crazy. Things are, I mean, uh, people are under a lot of stress. I get it. But I'm not called to compare myself to other pastors. I'm called to compare myself to this book. And so how does my life compare to this? Because I can't correct anyone or apply truth to anyone until I've applied it to my own life. And I think we get it upside down sometimes. I think we get it and we, we want to go out and try to fix everybody. And God's saying, hang on a second. It's a story in 2 Samuel chapter 11, chapter 12. And it starts off 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says, while all the kings were away fighting wars, David stayed at home. And he was at the temple and he decided he was going to send all of his, you know, his, his generals and his army out without him. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, they're fighting wars on the front lines. He's the captain of the army. He's the king of Israel. And he decided to stay back. And one afternoon, he was getting dark, and he decided to go out on the ledge of his, of his balcony. Now, he's the king, y'all. So in that day, in, in Jerusalem, he would have the highest house. The purpose, people with the most money, it's like the beach. They got the biggest stuff, right? They're at the top corner suite. They're in the, they're in the, they got all the windows and they're at the very top. Well, David was there. He should have been on the field with his, with the soldiers. But it said he came out and he, and he started hanging out around the edge and the ledge of his balcony. And he looked down and, and in that day, the, the people would bathe on their roofs. I wouldn't try that. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, but, I'm just, but, but in that, so, and in, in he, I'm sure he knew that. And so he looked down and he seen, you know, Bathsheba down there. And he thought, that looks pretty good. I'm going to send her up here and I'll have a talk with her. Well, I don't know what he told himself. He knew exactly what he was going to do, right? Shouldn't have been there. Not only should he have not been there, he was supposed to be fighting, but he came out of his house, he got on the roof, and he walked all the way to the edge in the ledge to just look down and see what's going on out there. And he calls her up. They sleep together. She's married. He's married. Her husband's on the front line fighting. David, because he's king, could fix it himself. Or so he thought. So he sent Uriah, her husband, to the front lines of battle. He was killed. And he thought, well, problem solved. And so he just keeps on rolling like nothing happened until chapter 12. <laughs> Second Samuel 12. And, and, and I mean, I'm, it just happens to be the prophet's name was Nathan. And, and, and so it says, God, <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> And so God it says God sends Nathan to go pay a visit with David. You know, David's just chilling, doing his thing, you know, probably eating strawberries and just, you know, feet up, heart playing, got Bathsheba and, you know, whatever else he's got going on in there. And I got a few minutes for this, this prophet. Bring him in. Well, Nathan doesn't go right to it. He tells him a story. Because at this time, David, in his mind, he was good. He talks about these sheep, and a certain man had a bunch of sheep, very wealthy. And there was this one guy, he only had one sheep. And he came into town, and the rich man decided, I'm going to take this one guy's sheep, and we're going we're to cook that sheep. We're going to use this one for dinner. And David, after the story, Nathan told him the story, 
he said, asked David, what should happen to this man that took this one person's sheep? He only had one, and then this guy had everything. David said, he should be killed. Take him out and burn, right? Like, this, that's, that's wrong. And then Nathan looked right at him. I got the verse for you. He said, thou art the man. He said, it's you. David didn't see it. David didn't see it. Here's the king of Israel that's the most powerful man on the planet at the time, that was leading the most powerful army on the planet at the time, and he didn't see in his own life And so sometimes God will send people to help us see things. That we have blind spots. Every person has them. That's why it's so critical, I think, that we come to church and that we're in community and we have other people in our lives. Because if you got spinach in your teeth, a lot of times you're the only one that don't know it. And, uh, and how long do you want to sit there and talk to everybody with spinach in your teeth? Don't you want somebody to say, hey, dude, you got spinach in your teeth? David could have killed Nathan. David could have chopped the dude's head off, sent him packing, and said, I don't got time for this. He could have. It was a bold move for him to walk into the highest, the most powerful person on the planet and tell him a story and then say, it was truth. It hit him right in the heart. He said he, 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 lost, he lost it. He repented. If it wasn't for, but I want you to hear this. If it wasn't for that mistake that David made, we'd never have Psalm 51. If it wasn't for, I mean, I'm not condoning the mistakes that David made, but here's what I'm realizing. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has a past. Everybody has stuff in their life that they wish they didn't have. Everybody's got things going on. But there's, it's just amazing to me that God can take some of our biggest mistakes and make them our biggest testimonies. Now, here's a man that made a terrible mistake that, uh, that, that, according to the law, should have disqualified him from leadership. But out of that, God gave us Psalm 51, which is an incredible prayer of repentance. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a beautiful psalm. God can even use our mistakes, but I want you to see how it works. It works when we are able to see the truth. God has called us to be truth tellers. Now I want you to be encouraged when you come here. And I like to encourage people, and I know that's one of my gifts. But before we encourage people, we're called to be truth tellers. We're called to speak the truth in love. But not only that, our life will continue to get better and we will grow in our faith when we surround ourselves with people who will speak truth to us. And a lot of times we'll stagnate in our faith, we'll stagnate. Now this is not just Christianity, I think this is universal in anything. If you lead a business and you lead a company, if you don't have people around you that will tell you the truth, you're just not going to grow. You're going to think you're the best thing that's ever been, <laughs> right? You're the, you're, you're, I mean, and, and, you got, and I'm not saying they're, they're belittling. I'm not saying it's out of a mean spirit, but it's out of love. I want you to get better. And the only way to get better is with truth. Nothing gets better without honesty. And so we apply it to ourselves, the second place. We apply it to others. Iron sharpens iron. Jesus prayed, I want them to be sanctified. How are they going to get sanctified? It's going to be when they submit to truth in their life. It's going to be when we submit to somebody in our life and allow them to look at our life and speak into our life and say, hey, this probably shouldn't be going on. Hey, David, you probably shouldn't be hanging out on the edge of the ledge of the balcony when all these women are taking baths. You might slip up. I don't know. <laughs> you know like, like, I mean, somebody who's watching out for our soul. I borrowed this from an oncologist, but when a doctor has to tell a patient hard truth, there's three things that they do. I don't, these are not in your notes. The first thing, they clearly identify where the problem is. I want to speak truth in others. If God shows you something, number one, clearly identify it. 
hey, this is going on. Hey, you're, you know, you got spinach in your teeth. The problem's right there. Or your, your breath is bad. That's the problem. They clearly identify it. Like, like, tell them, hey, this is going on. I see this in your life. This was so hard for me to do for a long time. I felt like my call was just to encourage people. Oh, I know your breath is bad, but it's okay. God's going to take care of it. No, go buy you a toothbrush down at CVS. Get you some of that menthol, you know, toothpaste and brush your, brush your, stop praying for God to take your bad breath away when he's giving you the ability. Is anybody hearing this? <laughs> we need this. We need this in our lives. And we have to, we have to give this to the people we love because we can love them to death. They identify, an oncologist, if he's telling somebody they have cancer or something bad is going on, they identify, number one, where the problem is. The second thing they do is they share the news kindly. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, it's not, it's, well, I hate it for you. It's just, I, haven't seen a, I haven't seen a scan like this in 30 years of doing my prayer. I mean, wow, God is, you, did, did you, do you kill puppies or something for a living? I don't know, I mean, no, I just... No, no, we, we, we do it kindly. <laughs> <Y'all>, <I'm>, <laughs> we do it kindly. Oncologists, I didn't come up with this. The third thing is they share the news immediately. Because bad news doesn't get better if we wait to tell it. I'm finding that out now. Just, you know, when we, it's, it's, as soon as you see it, say it. Let them know. Hey, this is going on. This is, this is, this is where I see it's happening. I'm not doing it just to point out faults in your life. I'm doing it because I want you to get better. I want you to get healed. I want you to get the help that you need. Frederick Buechner said that, that a good church group should look like AA. We just make it so cute, you know, church crews. They just make it, y'all pray for me. I hit a butterfly on the way here. Oh, you know, or, you know, like, like, like it's just cute. We just try to act like we got nothing going on in our lives. And, and he says, no, no, when we really are being discipled and we're really growing in our faith, we are putting our stuff out there so that people can help us with it. Hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm an addict. Struggled most of my life. I've been good for about four years, but man, this world is going crazy. You know, I mean, it just feels good to say the truth. Mark Twain said, tell the truth, you won't have to remember anything. But we don't like to do that, especially in church. We want to make it cute. Or we want to, you know, we want to, or we want to just act like everything's okay and not really tell anybody the truth. But I'm, I'm just, that's the only way. Jordan Peterson, 12 Rules for Life, I think it's Rule 8, tell the truth, and if you can't tell the truth, at least don't lie. <laughs> That's the devil's workshop. He's the father of lies. He manufactures them. That's why the truth is so important right now. That's why it's never been more critical than in this, the moment we're living right now to know what is truth, what is real. Because so many people are living their life in a fantasy. <laughs> it is. <sighs> Help me, Lord. So we, we share the truth with ourselves. We share the truth with others. And here's the last place I feel like God's called us to apply truth. It's in the outside world. See, and I think what happens is a lot of times we start with the outside world. Like we find this truth and it's worked for us. And so I want to go out and tell everybody in the world what they're doing wrong. And I want to fix everything in the world. And it's all, you I mean, it's, the, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but we're going to fix it. You know, like, like I, no, no, no. I, I, Jesus has said, okay, I, I, once you know the truth, you need to apply it to yourself first. You want to change the world? Submit yourself to truth. You want to change the world? Listen for my voice in your life individually you want to change the world like mother Teresa go home and love your family so many Christians are, are just like like just kind of getting I think pulled to the left and pulled to the right because we feel like it's our job to interpret what's going on in the world 
And it's not. It's our first job to interpret what's going on in this world. <laughs> Everybody's got a world, right? You've got your own personal world. And apply the truth there. And then apply it in your family, in your church family, in the people that love you. Then we look at the world. Matthew 24, Jesus talks all about it. It's the subheading is the sign of the times. And Jesus said, yeah, we're, we're going to be able to look at the world and know where we are, know what's happening. We don't look at the world as Christians and get frightful. We look at the world and know, man, we're just one day closer to glory. I'm just one day closer to walking in the purpose God has for me. I'm just one day closer to God fulfilling the dream that he put in my heart. That the darker that it gets in the world, the more confusing it gets in the world, the brighter your light's going to shine, the more encouraged that we should get. I got four people with me this morning, y'all. <laughs> and so we apply it to the world. The way Dr. Henry Cloud describes it, he says, we have to define reality. Some people have no definition of reality. They're just living in a, in a fantasy or they're living in a lie. I did it a long time. I know what it's like to be deceived, to be living something that's just not real, that's just not true. And it took somebody who loved me enough to tell me the truth, not out of a a mean spirit but just kind loving I want I don't want you to live this way John chapter 8 Jesus is teaching to a crowd and this is the last story I got it was a setting probably similar there who knows where he was at but he's teaching to a crowd and, and the Pharisees the high priests the, the religious leaders of the day caught a woman in adultery and so during church, during, during the teaching, it'd be like somebody running through these doors and throwing somebody down and saying, hey, I caught them right in the act. It's known as the, the story of the woman caught in adultery. I didn't realize that he was teaching when it was happening. So this is humiliating to this, this woman. Can you imagine that? The high priest pulling you to the, to the, I mean, just it was humiliating. And he threw her down, the high priest threw her down at Jesus' feet. And said, what should be done to this woman? She was caught in, in the act of adultery, and we all seen it. The law said she should be stoned. And he, they were right. That was the Old Testament law. Again, Jesus was asked 160-some-odd questions. You know how many he answered with the question? Almost all of them. But several he didn't answer at all. Here's another one. What is truth? Silence. Woman caught in adultery. What should we do with her? He didn't answer. He got down and he started writing in the sand. I would love to know what he wrote. <laughs> I would love to know what he wrote. I don't know what he wrote. But I have a, a guess. <laughs> it said that the, her accusers the ones that brought her to Jesus, as he began to write, each one of them left, one at a time, from the oldest down to the youngest. My guess is that Jesus was writing some names. And the high priest looked down and said, ooh, okay. <laughs> the oldest. Yep, that did happen, didn't it? And so as he wrote, it says all the accusers left, and he looked at the woman, and he said, where'd your accusers go? I don't accuse you either. And then he said these powerful words, this is how Jesus treated people. This is the goal. This is the aim. How do we speak the truth in love, right? Ephesians 4, that's what we're called to do, to speak the truth in love. Jesus modeled it. He did more than define it. He lived it. He said, I don't condemn you. He could, but he didn't. The law says she was guilty. Everyone around says she was guilty. But he looked at her and said, go and sin no more. Now, what does that mean? It means that he knew exactly what she had done. He seen her at her worst, but he spoke to her in her best.
And when we speak the truth in love, it's, be, it's being able to see people at their absolute worst. And not condemning them, not throwing another stone, because a lot of times when we make mistakes, it's ju- we're judging our own self. We're carrying around the shame and the weight of that decision. I don't need another stone. <laughs> And in compassion and mercy and love, he reached down, he defended her, but he didn't leave her. He said, I'm going to give you the strength to go and sin no more. It's, 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 this, it's speaking this truth from a heart and posture of love. And I'm seeing now in life, if you're taking notes, that just truth without love is mean. And you can find a lot of churches that got a lot of truth. You can find a lot of people that got a lot of truth. But they don't have love. And they feel like it's just their obligation to, to, to speak the truth and to fix the world, but they don't love them. You can't reach or help anybody you don't love. And I'm finding some of my friends that the more they, they know this truth, the farther they drift away from the reality of who Jesus is. So it's not just about knowing this book. But, but love without truth, it's, it, it, you know, truth without love is mean. And then just love without truth, right? We can just love everybody. It's meaningless. Well, I'm just going to love them. I'm just going to love them. I'm just going to love them. Well, we, we do that. We love them. But Jesus loved that woman right where she was. But then he helped her. He spoke truth to her. I don't condemn you. I know, I know what you've got going on. I, under, I, I get it. But I'm not going to be, I'm not going to add one more ounce of condemnation to your life. Go and sin no more. He loved her enough not to leave her where she was. And so love without truth is just, it's just meaningless. And I know we've seen that. It's just we have to go beyond that. And I think it's truth in love. And it's medicine. How do, we, how do we grow spiritually? How do we find healing in our lives from the things that's setting us back? How do we walk this faith journey out? We do it by walking in truth and love. We do it by speaking truth in love. We do it by receiving truth in love. And that's not a popular way to live. I'm just be honest with you. <laughs> it's not an easy way to live. It's really hard to hear truth sometimes. It's really hard to speak into people's lives. I have a hard time doing it. But I think we're going to find that as we do that, that God will give us the strength. It's, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. And in this prayer, he lets him know, I'm not leaving you alone. The spirit of truth is coming. He calls him, Jesus would call him the parakletos, the helper. And, and, and if we name the name of Christ this morning, we have that inside of us. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. He doesn't live in a building. He doesn't live in the Holy of Holies anymore. He lives in you, your heart, your soul. That's where, the, that's where God dwells. And so you're walking around with this glory in you that's the spirit of truth. That's why people, you bother people on the job. Come on, somebody. That's why the world hates you. I mean, that's why that people will point fingers because it, it's the complete opposite spirit of what's happening in the world. And so we're not called to fit in. We're called to stand out. We're called to be truth tellers. We're called to be able to walk in humility, to be able to receive hard truth in our own life. Patrick Lencioni, he's a business guy. But in one of his books, he writes about, it's called The Advantage. And he talks about uncomfortable conversations. And he went as far as to say, the success in our life in one year is going to be based on the amount of uncomfortable conversations we're willing to have. 
That's speaking the truth in love. That's staying at the table and disagreeing and fighting it out and saying, all right, we didn't get to an agreement here, but we'll come back tomorrow. Because I've, called, I've been called to walk with you and you've been called to walk with me and we need to walk this thing out and we're just going to keep speaking the truth in love until the Holy Spirit does what he needs to do. Thank y'all. I have got, I mean, I don't know where you came from, but you need to come on. You need, you need. Has anybody got an extra house in it? Yeah, can, I know y'all are visiting, but I met, I met this, this awesome family coming in, and um, I just thank, thank God for you this morning. Let's speak the truth in love. Let's ask God to speak the truth into our lives. And he may send a person, he may just do it by the Holy Spirit. A lot of times people know exactly <laughs> what one thing, if it got better in your life, would make the biggest difference. They know exactly where they need to focus. But there's a lot of times where we can't get better and we can't get the spinach out of our teeth if we don't have anybody else that can help us, that can see it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for truth. We thank you that, that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word to be able to walk. David said that this word that we have, it's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. How do we navigate this world that seems to be dark and confusing at times? We do it with the truth. We do it walking hand in hand with you. And so, Lord, we ask, just, just as David prayed in Psalm 51, search my heart, God. Let the spirit of truth, we open our heart to the spirit of truth this morning. And we ask, Lord, is there anything in me that's offensive to you? Is there anything in me that doesn't need to be there? Is there some wrongs in my life that I may have committed years and years ago that, that I need to make right. I need to write that letter. I need to set that lunch up and go and see them. I know it's been years, but I've been carrying this around. And so just pray this, Lord, search my heart. Search my heart, God. I want to open my heart to the spirit of truth. God, that you, would, that you would show me, identify, Lord, put your finger on the, the areas where maybe I need, to, I need to make some changes. But then, Lord, we receive that love, that love that once that truth comes, that gives us the strength to walk it out. And Lord, this isn't a love that we can manufacture. This isn't a love that we can go and buy more of. It's a love that comes from heaven. And so, Lord, we need that love in our lives. We need that love, God, in our soul. We need to receive that love. And, Lord, help us to give that love every day. Lord, we just thank you. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.